Today on The Grave Talks, a conversation about the haunts of Mackinac Island. Mackinac Island in Michigan is famous for its fudge, history, and natural beauty. It's attracted visitors for generations. It's like a step back in time, where cars are prohibited and horses, bikes, and boats are the primary ways of transportation. Not only is it one of Michigan's top tourist attractions, but it's also known as one of the state's most haunted locations. It's an island rich in history and steeped in mystery. From the theater at the Mission Point Resort to the Grand Hotel in Fort Mackinac, the island definitely has its share of haunted locations. And when it comes to the hauntings of Mackinac Island, Todd Clements wrote the book on it, literally. In fact, he's written two books on the ghostly side of the island, and he is also the owner of the Haunts of Mackinac Island Ghost Tour Company. Today on The Grave Talks, we'll talk about the haunts of Mackinac Island with author Todd Clements. When we talk about the haunts of Mackinac Island, which I want to get into today, you literally wrote the book on that. Yep. I, I um, took a long time as basically a lifetime of curiosity about Mackinac Island and its ghost stories and strange things and some of the weird history on the island. And I was always interested in it. And someone told me her name's Tam. She runs the bookstore. She said, I, and she didn't know who I was at all when she told me she's like i wish someone would just write a book on it and i was like huh you know i was a freelance writer at the time so i was like i'm gonna do this took a few years to get the book together um doing research into archives for the state park archives from the state of michigan i went to the university of michigan's uh historic archive library bentley library spent days there going through boxes and boxes of paperwork that the state park did not have um, I saw one parchment paper uh, letter from a soldier to his parents. It was in like laminate and you had to have like gloves on, even though it was in like this plastic sheeting to even look at it. It's really hard to read. I mean, I just, yeah, I dug into the history deeper than most people do. And so often, and I say this all the time, but when you look into the history and you understand the history of a location, Frequently, it helps you better understand the haunts. Did you find that in in your case? Oh, yeah. Um, some of our the stories that we knew there was a ghost story, but we didn't know why. We we're like, well, okay, there's there's reports of this activity, and they look at what people have seen and things. Okay, so let's go and look and see what was this building originally? Who was there? Why would somebody haunt? Who would stick around if they died to haunt it? Do they have a reason to be there? Uh, so we just started putting puzzle pieces together. And there's a few of the, the ghost stories that we've collected over the years that it's just like, okay, this is what's seen here, which looks exactly like what's seen here and what's seen here. Is there a story behind why they would be seen in these specific places? And it all these, it seems to be the same person. So we started doing our research and we got some of the things that were like, wow. That makes sense. Okay, we've got a time period. There's one ghost uh, we call it, in the book. It's called the Happy Haunt of Hoban Street. Um, it's not a scary ghost story. I think it's a residual haunt, which means it's not necessarily conscious of what it's doing. It's just doing the same thing over and over again, and it's repeating its its event, what happened, and we found out what happened. So there's a theater on the island. It's now a haunted house. It's been a haunted house since the 1970s. But back in the early 1900s, it was a movie house for silent movies. So we get this story of a ghost. It's a woman. She's got a white dress, Victorian style clothes, hat, parasol. She has a purple sash around her waist. And we're just like, okay, great. We know she's from the Victorian era, which is a pretty good stretch of time. Mm Mm-hmm. But it gave us a start. And then one person came to me and said they heard her singing or whistling. She wasn't singing. She was whistling a song. And he recognized it, but couldn't remember what it was. But he'd heard it before. We had a second person come to us 
a couple years later who said, oh, yeah, I know this song. It's called Hearts and Flowers. And I'm like, I don't know what song that is. It's an old time movie, an old time silent film accompaniment song. And I found out what it was. If you ever watched the movie Christmas Story with Ralphie and the BB gun, in the scene where he gets soap poisoning, and he's, it was soap poisoning. The song that's playing during that scene is Hearts and Flowers. That's the song she was humming. Oh. So we went and looked it up, found out when the song was made, when it was written and it was a popular song. And it, I think it was late 1800s it came out. But in 1912, 1911, there was a silent film called Hearts and Flowers. It's music that when accompany the song, the, the movie was Hearts and Flowers. So we're, we're like, okay. We have a silent movie house. It was a big hit at the time. They probably, we don't, there's no, we couldn't find any way to find out what movies they played there. There's no record of it. We couldn't find it anywhere. We tried. So we assumed if it was a big hit, it was probably playing there. And we've got a ghost story of a woman humming the song Hearts and Flowers. She's seen at the theater. She's seen in a field and a walking through out in the open. She's seen on Hoban Street, and she lived in a house on Hoban Street where she disappears when you see the ghost. Once she hits the front door where her house originally stood, she vanishes. She's just gone. So we're like, okay, so we've got a woman who's humming this song, Hearts and Flowers. She's happy. We know what she's wearing. Now, because we know when that's, that movie was a hit, we know kind of the era so we're thinking 1911 1912 okay so where does she disappear what was the history of the land that she disappeared we found out it's not there anymore but there was a hot place called um oh gosh i'm blanking on the name right now their last name was lapine her name's Catherine lapine um they had a boarding house their family lived in the back they rented rooms in the front and she lived there and when she hits that door she disappeared but she would hum the song and she'd walk this path and we're like, okay, who is Catherine Lapine? We did find information about her. Uh, she had a summer fling that turned into a serious love affair on the Island that summer when that movie was playing, she wound up getting engaged to the man she fell in love with and he left his wife for her. And we were thinking now this is again, speculation that perhaps the two of them saw this movie together. He may have proposed to her that night. We don't know for sure. And she was walking home, which was very close. It's not far from the theater. She walks about the back of the theater towards her house, which would be, there's buildings in the way now, but there's openings where there's people have seen this woman in the openings. There's a restaurant standing where the cemetery, one of the island cemeteries used to be, but they moved it. And people see her in the women's restroom in the back of the restaurant where she would have walked originally to go home. And then they see her come out onto the street right by where her house was and go straight into the house. We're like, this is the same ghost. We think it's Catherine Lapine. The story fits. The description fits. The music fits. The year fits. A highly emotional moment. A woman's leaving his wife for her and they're in love and they got engaged that summer. It all just kind of fit together. Now, we could be completely wrong on that one, but everything seemed to fit together. It and totally people will makes sense. Still to this day, say they see this woman. Um, usually, the most common place they see her is behind Lakeview Hotel. If you have a rear hotel room facing um, inland, you might see her in the middle of the night. It's usually late at night, it's usually between 11 and, and 2 in the morning is the times that people have said they've seen her. They've seen her in the alley behind the theater, which at the time wasn't an alley. Uh, it was an open area. And then they seen her at the restaurant where she would have walked, which she would have meant she walked through the cemetery to get home because it was the shortest way home. And yeah, so you... she lived out her life happy. They got married. They, they moved to Ho uh Houghton and no Hancock, Michigan, in the UP, and they lived their their days there happily married, had kids and everything, and 
no tragic ending. Just we think that's why it's a residual haunt is because it was a very happy and exciting moment. Somehow got trapped in time and occasionally plays itself out for us to see. That's it's interesting. still a phenomenon that everyone's doing research on. No one really knows exactly how it happens, but something to do with geology and construction materials. <laughs> People have got a lot of theories on how residual haunts stay. What's keeping them there? And I was convinced this story was going to end with some tragic thing where the husband did not leave his wife. She ended up dying with a broken heart. But I love that it didn't end sadly. Like that was a happy time in her life. That's, and that's yeah. what's being recreated. That's why we happy, happy haunt on Hoban. <laughs> that's and that could have, you know, that. and that could have been their song. They could have gone to that movie and that was their song. And that's the one that she loves to yep. sing. And that was such a happy time. And, Tell me a little about Mackinac Island and kind of geographically where you'll find it and, you know, how sure. you get to it. Because it's not like you just drive your car there. Mackinac Island is an island in the middle of the Straits of Mackinac between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. And it's been a historical like landmark for a long, long time. And, and when you say long, long time, like I was reading, it goes back to indigenous people. Yep. You know, the British took um, it over in like the War of 1812. So, I mean, this little island has some deep, deep history. The theory goes is they think that the island started to have inhabitants. And this is, again, you can't really prove it because of how long, 8,000 years. That oh, wow. is one of the theories out there. Some people say it's a few hundred years. They say that. Native Americans started showing up some point after the Ice Age. And the history behind the island, why it's called Great Turtle, and why it has so much mythology on it, is when the Ice Age ended and the glaciers were receding and the lakes were starting to drop down and the rocks formations were starting to rise up from losing the weight of all the glaciers on top of them, that was coming up and it looked like a turtle, a giant turtle coming out of the water. And that's how the name great turtle or, or the Michelin Mackinac, some people say translates to great turtle. There's con there's conflict on whether that's true or not, but basically it looked like a turtle was coming out of the water and it got the name, the great turtle. And we have lots of things. We have turtle, great turtle brewery. Great. We have turtle toys. We, Lots of turtle things on Mackinac Island. There was Fort Mackinac on the island for a long time as well, right? Yep. Um, the fort was on the island. It was originally built as a British fort around the time of the Revolutionary War. There weren't any full battles fought at the fort. There were battles on the island, but the fort never saw any like serious action. It was always off in the distance from the fort. Um, there was one battle, uh, in, during the war of 1812 that was fought out near, there's a golf course now, Washcomo golf course. There was a actual land battle with rifles and cannons and all that there between the Americans and the British. The British had possession of the Island. The Americans wanted the possession of the Island. So they fought for it. The British won that battle and the American side retreated, but eventually it was the treaty of Ghent in I believe it was 1814 that gave the island back to the Americans and it's been ours ever since. And when did it really start becoming what we know of today with, you know, a lot of tourism, um, kind of a summer place for people, rich people <laughs> to live. Yeah. Um, when did it, it started, start that? Well, at first the fort was kind of a strategic position in, in the Great Lakes, and that was the fort was there. Small village in Mackinac, uh, Mackinac Island was there, but the fort was pretty much why it was there was to protect shipping and and trade and everything along the, the lines of doing that. And then eventually, it became a huge area for fishing and trappers, fur trappers. Uh, so it became a major industrial hub. It was not originally a touristy area. That came later. Um, fur trade was a big, big part of U.S. history, world history. I mean, fur trade was a big thing. Mm -hmm. And the island was a good location. 
because it was kind of centralized. You had the Upper Peninsula, you had Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, parts of Canada. It was all kind of centralized around the Straits of Mackinac. So the 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 Mackinac Island became a huge trading hub for the fur trade. Uh, the Astors were there. There's uh, Madeleine Lafombois, which I can talk a little bit about her. She was one of America's first female millionaires. She was a fur trader. And they were just looking for a good place that they could trade the furs and get their payment and go back out and spend months out in the middle of wilderness hunting and trapping. And they bring it back and get their money and then go back out and do it. And Mackinac Island was just a central place for that. And then it eventually the fur, the trend with uh, fur hats and all the fur kind of faded away. And then they became a fishing and there was a lot of white fish and they would pull them out and, Mackinac Island is famous for its whitefish. I don't know how many are still left in the waters <laughs> because they've been fished pretty heavily, but whitefish was a big thing. And then after that, it pretty much started into tourism. And that's where it is today. And it looks absolutely beautiful. It is. It is a state park. Um, about 80% of the island is state park. 20% is commercial or residential. But most of it is, and it's a pretty raw state park. I mean, there's areas that are, are paved or gravel, but there's hiking trails that you can get lost on. And there's rocky terrain and just wilderness terrain, and there's bluffs, and there's land formations like Arch Rock, Sugar Loaf, Devil's Kitchen, There's there's and there's legends behind all of those. It's, it's a pretty incredible place. It doesn't look like it fits in the state of Michigan. I don't know if you can't drive cars there or... You have to have certain permissions. Are there no cars on the island? How does that work? Because there's got to be some way to get things around. There there are ways to get around. Um, Primarily, uh, cars are illegal. You cannot have a private car on the island. There there is an ambulance. There's fire truck. Uh, There's a couple of maintenance pickup trucks that are used primarily for emergencies or to haul very, very large equipment. Usually you won't see them in the summer that much. You'll see the ambulances and fire trucks and a police car on, in the summer. You won't see any of the, like, when they're, like, building a hotel. You won't see the semi-trucks usually in the summer when it's tourist season. They usually do it off-season. Oh. And they have to file for special permits. And they can only do it certain times of the day, certain days. They have to file all this paperwork to move anything that is in a car or a truck on the island. And um, there have been times where people snuck cars on the island. Hasn't been recent, but there we've seen the cars. They, they're they still there. They're in a huge trash area. There's three cars that you look at them and you're like, that's an old car. <laughs> we think they're like 1920s, 1920s cars, maybe 1930s. Um, we think one's a Plymouth. We got, we're not 100% sure. There's photos of some of the cars that have been on the island, but uh, they would keep them hidden and they keep them away from town. Um, there was the three that we found that there are just rusted out wrecks of cars. There's not much left of them, but they're in the middle of the woods. And if you don't know somebody that knows where they are, you're not going to probably find them because there's no trail to them. So if, say, I had a lot of money, and I bought a house yep. on Mackinac Island, yep. pretend. So I'm assuming like the big items, the furniture and stuff would come across on a ferry or something. And then at it, certain times the of the year. We have freight ferries. They're big flat ferries okay. that can haul trucks. Our UPS, FedEx, Amazon, they come over on a truck, but the truck can't leave the dock. So they unload it. And the way we basically are semi trucks would be drays they're big flatbed carriages and they're pulled by a team of draft horses and you load it up and they take it wherever it needs to go on oh, be darn. so you don't have the they don't have the amazon guy just drive up in front of their house or apartment building nope. and run in and most wow. of it is done on a dray if it's small we are ups guys on the island if it's small, they have it, they have like a cart on a bicycle or they'll put it, they'll just walk it wherever it needs to go. Most of everything that's going to be delivered, unless it's going to a residential area, is going to be downtown, which is all pretty walkable. 
it's not hard. You just get a cart and you move things around. So to go get groceries, you so just take your cart. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, there's a grocery store on the island and they do deliver costs extra, but now, yep, I, we just go to the grocery store and get what we need. How did it's not you, a big one. It's small, but and it's, it's actually the oldest grocery store in Michigan. It's one of the oldest grocery stores in the United States. If it's not the oldest, it might be the oldest. There's been people who said there's is older, but you know how that goes. <laughs> Changed owners, moved locations. It's no longer the oldest. You and know? you wouldn't have all of the chain stores like we have, the Kroger's and... Nope. We have Dowd's Market, which is our grocery store. There are a couple of franchises that managed to get in before they passed the law about franchises. We have a Starbucks. Nothing uh, can actually, stop a Starbucks. when that Starbucks opened, they passed the law that no franchise is allowed to be established on Mackinac Island unless its world headquarters is located on Mackinac Island. That's the loophole. But we have a Starbucks. We have a fudge store called Kilwins, which is a chain. It's, I don't know if they're, they might be, I think they are a national chain, but they're based in Michigan. They're in Petoskey, Michigan. But they have a place, we have a Saunders Fudge Shop. These are all places that opened up before the, this, the ban on franchising pretty much came into effect. We had a Pizza Hut at one time, but it was nobody knew it was there. It was kind of tucked <laughs> away at a, one of the hotels. It wasn't a Pizza Hut the way you think it was a Pizza Hut. They served pizza, made Pizza Hut pizza, but it wasn't a Pizza Hut restaurant. It was like underground. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like a... It was like we've got the secret recipe. Deli ice cream shop out at one of the resorts and they had Pizza Hut pizza. How did you then become associated with Mackinac Island? Did you live nearby? Do you live there? What's your history? When I was personal. Yeah. When I was little, we had a cottage on Lake Huron and we would it was not far from Mackinac Island. So we would go up there for the summer, not all summer, but pretty good chunks of the summer we'd be at our cottage. And we would go to Mackinac Island every now and then uh, just because it was something else to do. And we were done with the lake and swimming and all that. We would go up to Mackinac because it was a change of pace. And my parents felt more comfortable, my brother and I, going there because there were no cars that could hit us. There really isn't a whole lot we could do that could get us in a serious, like, danger. So we would go there a lot. And we would go biking, hiking, exploring. My brother and I were cave hounds. We were looking for the caves. There's caves on the island. Nothing like mammoth caves. They're usually, most of the caves are pretty small. Um, They're just kind of scoops out of the rock, and you can crawl into them for 15 feet, and that's what you got. That's it. But we would look for them all because they all had fun names and they had history. And there was rumor that there were bones in the caves from the Native Americans that originally settled the island because they used it as a burial ground. And we never found any of the bones. Uh, But we did find some of the caves that aren't on the main tourist maps. There's a few. Um, Some of them have been lost to time. One, One got blown up because they were paving the road around the island and they got rid of one of the caves because it was in the way. And then there's some that are hidden behind bushes and you never know. You walk by them every day. One of the biggest things to do on the island is ride your bike around the island. And people go by one of these caves every day and no one even knows it's there. It's just up the hill, like the bluff, maybe 15, 20 feet up. It's not that hard of a climb to get to it behind some bushes. It's just sitting there. No one knows it's there. (laughs) But what right. then drew you to the paranormal side of Mackinac sure, Island? Sure, sure. So we would go up to the island a lot. I was always interested in weird things. I was like that growing up as a kid. I was always interested in like UFOs and Bigfoot and ghost stories and all these things. But I never really got serious about it until I was about 12 years old. And my parents took us to the island and we stayed for a long weekend on the island. We stayed out at Mission Point Resort and we were swimming at the pool and just being tourists. We're swimming at the pool and I sit down next to my mom and I'm looking around because right behind the resort, there's huge bluffs, maybe 80, 90 feet high. And they're rock limestone bluffs. And I see someone standing on the bluff in one of the areas of the bluff. And I'm like, something not right because he wasn't really solid. 
he was kind of like he was transparent looked like a person but he wasn't a person and i turned to my mom i go look 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 and it was gone just gone vanished and i was like okay that does that that was i that said a ghost (laughs) was that actually a ghost (laughs) My brother and I later that day went up there to try and see where he was. If someone could have just ducked out of the way, because at first I knew what it, this wasn't a person, but I just wanted to make sure what was up there that it wasn't like someone just playing games. And where he was standing, there's nowhere to run and hide. It wasn't at the top of the bluff, and it wasn't at the bottom. It was in the upper half of the bluff. There's like a, a ledge of rock that you could climb down to we didn't do it uh it's probably 15 feet from the top and you could climb down to it and you could stand on it if you really wanted to but there's no way someone could turn their head and turn their head back and they could climb up they'd either have to jump like superman i mean they, they, there's there's no way anyone could disappear from vision from being able to be seen from that bluff and i was like yep that was not that was not a person that was a ghost and after that I wasn't looking for caves anymore. I was looking for ghost stories on the I, You found something more interesting. I was I became the little kid that would ask everybody that lived or worked on the island, what's haunted? Where's they where's they seen ghosts? Where's this? And it was just a hobby. It was nothing serious. I was just curious. Every time we went over to the island, I would ask a carriage driver or someone who worked in a store. Or somebody, just anybody who was like working on the island. So what's haunted? It used to be where are the caves and then it turned to what's haunted. And um, so I just dove into it. I, When I was a kid, I read like Hans Holzer's books on the paranormal. I was reading um, the Time Life series on the mysterious world. I can't remember the name of it. It's Time Life series. I can't remember the name of it, the un, unexplained book series. I got all those. And I was just reading all these books. But the thing, funny thing is, is I go to a library to, to read up on these books, but I never would check them out of the books, out of the library, because I didn't want to be a kid that was looked at as weird. <laughs> <laughs> so I can relate I to that. I kept it underground that I was really into this. I had a couple friends who were into it too, but we were just kind of like, yeah, let's we don't want anyone at school to think we're like these really weird kids. So we didn't really put it out there that we were really looking into the Loch Ness monster and Bigfoot and UFOs and all these strange things in the world. But we just, when we were together, we'd talk about it and do this and that. But so that happened, that lasted for a very long time. I was always interested in it, but never did a lot. We did a little bit of ghost hunting, but nothing like we would do later, like people do today. It was sort of like we had dousing rods and a cassette tape recorder and we go places and see if we could get anything. And it's very amateur, but you're talking about teenager. I was a teenager when I was doing that. And eventually we, I, my wife and I got married and in 2003, we took a October trip to the Island and we, it was horrible weather. It was snow and then rain and then wet snow. It was miserable weather. So we wound up in the bookstore and I went to the person, she's still there today, Tam. I said, do you have any Mackinac Island books that have been written on the ghost stories on the island? Because I've always been interested in it and there's never been a book on it. She said, no, but I wish someone would write one. I was a freelance writer at the time. Never thought to write a book. I was doing like little things for magazines and little things for, I did a lot of training manuals for companies it was it was really dry writing it wasn't what i like doing (laughs) and i said i'm gonna write this thing i'm gonna do it i know a lot of these ghost stories if i do find more of the history on them and i can put this into a book so i was like i want to find the history that's not in the textbooks and easy to find i want to look for the unusual and unique history on the island the dark history and and Sure enough, I was, it took a lot of time. It took a few, it took three years to get that first book together. And I found a lot of unusual things. I found things that no one would talk about. I found where it came from. 
I didn't tell anybody I was writing. Only my family knew I was writing this book. A couple of friends, but no one on the island, maybe one person on the island, knew I was writing this book. So I wanted to keep it a secret because I didn't want anyone else to do it before I did it. So I came to the bookstore. I remember the day, 2006. I walk in the bookstore. I have my first print print of copies. I show them the book and her words, same person, Tam, she goes, finally, finally. I love that and story. Took, and that was a great thing for me. I was like, okay, so she's definitely going to buy the book for me. <laughs> she's interested. How many do you want? She goes, we'll take 50. That 50 didn't last a week. It was sold out. She ordered another 50. It was gone within days. And then she started ordering a hundred at a time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, some, this is a phenomenon. This is happening. And uh, other stores started carrying it and they were selling out. And I was like, I got a bestseller on my hands on the island. And I was like, I basically quit my day job and focused on the book. And it was just taking off. It did really well. It's still doing well. Um, the next year, I was like, I'll, I did my first printing of 5,000 books. I was like, and I self-published it. I had two publishing companies that were interested in taking the book on, but they told me how much they would give me for an advance and how much I'd get per copy. And I had a business background. And I was like, no, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I started my own publishing company, found printers, found editors, typesetting. I found yeah, every, it just, it's just a matter of looking for it, finding it. And we put it together and I was, that's why I self published the book. I think the two, uh, I know one of the companies that was going to publish me had contacted me two years ago to write another book on Hansa Mackinac in their format. And I was like, I don't want to compete with my own book right. for a dollar 50 a book. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I love this story. So that's because... kind of where it started. And it, because I was self-published, you're making enough money that you can make a living, not a great living, but it's definitely money. And I was like, I'm just going to focus on this. And that's what I did the next year. And that's actually where the tour came in. Um, at the end of the, the first full year, the books were out. It was Halloween weekend. And I did a book signing at the bookstore. And I had a sign-up sheet. I said, you know what? For one night only, I'm going to take go out with the author. I'm going to talk about the ghost stories in the book, some of the things that aren't in the book, some of the things that I've, I've learned since the book came out. And I'm just going to walk everybody around and tell you the stories. I had 70 people sign up for that. I did it, no charge, just go and do it. And 70 people signed up. Every single person showed up. I was like, I don't even know what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> and my wife kept saying, just talk about the book. Just remember, you know, the book and everything else, it'll just come to you. Just don't worry about it. They didn't pay for it. You're not cheating them on it because they didn't pay for it. It's free. Just have fun. Just talk about the ghost stories. Talk with them. See if they've seen anything, you know? And I was like, you're all right. I'm just going to have fun with it. So we went out and three and a half hours, give or take later, I finished it. <laughs> It took me that long because I just kept going and going and going. Um, I fell over a bicycle while we were doing the tour and <laughs> skinned my knee. It was just like, but I was having a really good time doing it. And we ended with 68 of the 70 people for three hours. They stayed with me. So I was like, they had a good, they must have had a good time. The two we lost was someone who was pushing someone in a wheelchair and they were just getting too tired to yeah. push them. And they, they came to me when they were leaving. They said, we really want to stay, but this is a lot of pushing <laughs> and we're tired. So we lost them. And then one guy at the end came up to me. He's the last person to leave. I was like, oh boy, here we go. What I do wrong? He said, you should be doing this every night and you should charge to do this. You could have a business doing this. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I could do that. So that was the birth of the tour was that one night. And the next year we found a really small place to rent on the island to run the tour out of. And we hired some people. I trained them everything I knew. And we went through the tour for a month before they ever actually went out and took guests. And we just, it was like a school. I was a teacher. I was teaching them the haunts of Mackinac. 
the ghost stories, the history, everything that I knew. And it took off and it's still going today. 16 seasons later, we've been doing the tour. And the second book came out in 2016. And again, sells great. I like it better than the, the first one because there's so many more personal experiences from people in the second one. First one was the legends and stories passed down. And some of it was current ghost stories. Some of it was older ghost stories that have been passed down from family to family. And as I was writing the second book, I was adding stories to the book as I was writing it that I was just getting. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to put that one in the book. Is there enough for a third, you think? Oh, yeah, I've got enough for a third. Wow. I've been starting to work on a third one. Um, I'm not I'm not a big fan of writing. I'm a big fan of research. So I do the love to do the research part, the writing part. I always am my I'm the biggest self-critic of what how I write something. And my wife's just like, that's why you have editing. Uh-huh. Listen to your it, wife. It gets out of your hands. It gets out of your hands into someone else's hands. And they tell you everything that you didn't tell them and everything you don't need to tell them. And she's right. She's Editors absolutely right. You've got a good wife. And, <laughs> she's smart. Yeah, I do. She's great. And she's read my books probably a dozen times while I'm working on them. And she's just like, enough. I'm good. Get it to somebody else. My, they need fresh eyes. What I find so and, interesting um, is that this all started with a fascination from when you were a little kid. And the fact that mm-hmm. you were able to write books and start this um, haunted history tours. I just think that's so fascinating that you turned a fascination into a career a career yeah it turned into my career it's what i do um small business owner but it's a business that there's only a handful of people in the the country that do it there mm-hmm. are other people who do what i do but it's just like there's only a few of us that actually have it as a career most people it's a hobby um maybe they wrote a book but i turned it into a full out career do you ever do tours every now and again cuz it's got to be fun occasionally it's it's not i don't do tours myself as much as i used to just because i know i get carried away with it (laughs) and i will talk to you for three or four hours and most people don't want to sign up to do that kind of a commitment for a ghost tour the ones that do it's pretty rare it's usually a private group someone who calls me ahead of time and they're just like yeah we want you to do it can you do it on these dates we do it we go out and we do it, or I do it, and usually it's very haphazard. It's nothing like the public tour. I'll go pick spots and ask them where they want to go, what do they want to see, what do they want to talk about, me to talk about, and it's kind of just like it's they direct the tour, and I just give them everything. We're stopping everywhere. We're going places that are four <laughs> miles away from town. It's just and we're walking because like, there's no cars here. And yep, and we're walking it. Yep. What are some of the the places that you find very really fascinating on the island? I wrote down some places, but now that I've been talking to you, I'm like, you know the best places to talk about. Mission Point Resort, the theater at Mission Point Resort has always been my favorite place. That's where we did a very large number of our ghost hunts, public, private, just the haunts crew, just our tour guides. We would in, we've investigated Mission Point Theater. And I don't know how many times, but I would be comfortable saying 300 times, close to 300 times. There were times we've had full-bodied apparitions. We've seen, I haven't always been there. I've seen three or four in the theater, uh, which some people go their whole life and never see one. I've seen three or four in just that theater in the span of a few years. Uh, But we get other people on tour and think, oh, yeah, we saw, oh, my gosh, there was this little girl she's peeking behind this corner and there's no little kids here and we're locked in here. Oh, my gosh, there's a ghost. It's Lucy. We call her Lucy. We saw shadow figures one time. No one wanted to go anywhere near that. That was in a corner. And we saw them moving around. There were two of them. They were moving around. That was in the soundstage, which is right next to the theater. There's a huge, like, Hollywood soundstage there. It's used for conventions and, and big, like, events. And um, we were investigating that. That's where they filmed uh, a lot of the interior shots from the movie Somewhere in Time. But we're investigating. That's where we saw two shadow figures across the soundstage. Everybody saw them. 
And we were just like, whoa, what was that? <laughs> we're seeing them moving around and there's nobody over there. A flashlight, you put a flashlight over there. There's nobody there. Take the flashlight away. And you could see the silhouette of two figures that look like people moving around. But um, we've had been physically touched twice in the theater. We've got more EVPs in the theater than I can count. It got to the point where it wasn't such a big deal to get an EVP anymore. It literally got to that point um, where we'd hear a voice and we're like, okay, we got one. Oh, they answered a question. Cool. Or <laughs> is it crazy. the boy? Is it the girl? Is it the woman? Which one is it? Is it, or, is it a little girl's voice, a woman's voice, or a man's voice? So we could identify which ghost we think it is that's talking. There's three that we we pretty much identified who they might be. And that wraps up part one of our conversation with Todd Clements. In part two, find out more about who is haunting the Mission Point Resort Theater, as well as we'll discuss some other haunted locations. You can purchase his books, Haunts of Mackinac Island and Haunts of Mackinac Island, the next chapter on Amazon. Get more information on the Haunts of Mackinac Ghost Tours at hauntsofmackinac.com. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advanced episodes, everything commercial free, become a gravekeeper. Sign up on Apple Podcasts and you can try it three days free. You can also go to patreon.com slash the grave talks, find everything there. Also all ad free. I'm Carol Hughes. And for all of us at the grave talks, thanks for listening. <laughs>